The Fern is the Southern Hemisphere's first passive house certified apartment building. We originally came across the site as a tenderer. We tended to build it for another developer who decided that it was all too risky and offered to sell us the site. So we managed to scrape together the funding and bought it, put a new DA through, always with the idea of doing a benchmark sustainable development and pushing the boundaries in terms of what you can achieve for sustainable design and construction without sacrificing architectural integrity and in a conventional business model. However, the passive house element, I really only came across that about six months before we broke ground on site. If it was a greenfield site, it would be perfect because you have a long north-south boundary and short east-west boundaries. So you'd do a, you know, a, a long rectangular shaped house with lots of north-facing glazing with shading eaves and all those passive solar things that we know work. However, here, there's a neighbour next door, so obviously we have to have a blank firewall on the north boundary. Bang, there goes passive solar. The only natural light you've got is from the east and west facades, which are unfavourable because the, the harsh morning and afternoon summer sun. So I thought, how can we overcome this? How, what can we work with? All roads seem to lead back to this German movement, this methodology called Passive House. So I, looked into it more and in more and more detail and, and formed the view that it was a, a very scientific, rigorous, uh, evidence-based system, which was, as I like to quip, invented by a building physicist, not an architect, so it actually works, and decided that that was going to be the way that we were going to overcome the site constraints. Passive House uses passive solar principles when they're available, but when conditions are unfavourable, it has a whole toolkit that passive solar doesn't have. That being effective glazing, so the glazing here is U-value 1.3, whereas a compliant apartment in this location would be 6 or 7. Super insulation, which in Sydney isn't that onerous. We've got R3.5 in the walls, R2 under the floor and R7 in the roof. Airtight ceiling, that's, that's really the big one. That's quite contentious in architectural circles in Sydney. I've had discussions with uh, very well established architects who are renowned for their sustainable design who have said, no, no, you want, you want air leakage in Sydney. You want, you want that, that loose fit. You want to be able to have that ventilation. Uh, whereas the passive house system would say, yes, you want ventilation, but you want to be able to control that ventilation. Whereas if you've got loose fit and, and uh, an air leaky building, then that's just as simple as drafts. No one likes drafts. So there was a lot of care taken in installing the doors and windows, sealing around the gaps, all the penetrations, conduits. Each electrical conduit was filled with mastic, um, specialised tapes um, and membranes. It was, it was quite a job. The other two are eliminating thermal bridges, which is concrete going in from inside to outside the building. So all these apartments you see with projecting cantilevered concrete balconies, they're all acting like, like heat sinks. So in winter, you're heating the interior and all that heat is being sucked out through the concrete slab and dissipated into the atmosphere. Very inefficient. Uh, and then in summer, they act like the opposite, so they pick up all the summer sun and that concrete slab's a super highway to bring all that inside and it's like turning underfloor heating on in the middle of summer. Now you're probably wondering how we manage the thermal bridging of all this highly conductive reinforced concrete, right? We invented a solution, of course. So you eliminate the thermal bridges and that gives you a more controllable interior. Finally, you've created this well-sealed, super-insulated esky for living in. You don't want to suffocate. So then you bring in the heat recovery ventilation, which gives you constant filtered fresh air in, down to allergenic levels. So you filter out pollen for hay fever sufferers, um, pollution, dust, all those things that we like to avoid. To, to achieve passive house, you have to hit 0.6 air changes per hour, 50 pascals pressure. Now, to put that into context, that is about 40 times more airtight than the average New South Wales home. 
as you walk in, you come off the busy Wyndham Street through this fairly compressed tunnel into this 15 metre high open atrium with the green walls going right up either side, which are individual pots and you can hang that on a galvanised mesh, which is what we did. Uh, behind that we did a waterproof membrane over the insulation, over the concrete, and the irrigation runs through every four rows and each pot drips down to the one below. The concept there is that it feels like walking into a rainforest valley out of the gritty city. By the time we went to Passive House, it had all been designed and engineered as concrete. I did toy with the idea of changing to CLT, but because we had the basement and then probably the ground floor uh, was partly underground, some areas of the site, we would have had to do a couple levels in concrete and then swap to CLT, and it was I just decided it was all too much too late. Uh, it would have delayed the project further, so we stuck with the concrete and we're actually taking post-occupancy data at the moment, so it will be very interesting to see how a very heavy thermal mass passive house plays out in the Sydney climate. The air sealing requirements for CLT or concrete, because once they're in place, they're both monolithic slab materials, which are inherently airtight apart from the joints. So you just go around sealing the joints. We found that all the cold joints in the concrete were inherently airtight. I learned on this project that I'm definitely an architect first, build a second and a, and a developer third. I set very high expectations for myself for the design and I come from a background of high-end residential where every single door handle and piece of joinery and junction is detailed at one to one or one to five and poured over on site and took that sort of mentality into this multi-residential environment which meant that um, it wasn't cheap and we were working with very tight tolerances so there was a lot of site labour involved, a lot of site finished work. The original intent for the building was to strata and sell the apartments uh, and my imaginary client was the kind of person who I'd done designs and buildings and renovations for for the last 20 years who really appreciated beautiful functional space and wanted to make this their home for many years to come. So we went to, to painstaking efforts to include as much storage as possible. To include a full-size gourmet kitchen in a one-bedroom apartment, uh, each apartment has about 20 cubic metres of joinery, which is what you'd commonly find in a two or three bedroom house. I had looked at the option of getting investors on board to buy out the bank and, and keep the building on completion, but just couldn't afford it, so decided to take it to market uh, as a going concern business. So we had it operating for six months as service departments, so actually that was a whole other project. We had to then furnish the apartments. I spent weeks at, at furniture auctions and looking on Gumtree. We, we, furnished, we, we basically furnished the whole apartment second hand. Uh, I feel like a much wiser guinea pig than when we went into it. There was a lot of suck and see, a lot of work it out as we go, and doing Passive House again, I feel like we would be so much more efficient on the way we approach it from concept design through the detailing and construction and what I would really like to do is take these principles into affordable housing because that's something we haven't tackled yet.